You're either the world's best or worst criminal. Either result is possible. It's just going to take a few tries to figure that out. Navigating a branching series of choose your path options that will either lead you to success or disastrous failures that would make the Redditors of our unexpected slightly exhale through their nostrils. <laughs> This series, that could be accurately labeled as either an interactive movie or game, has grown, improved, and persisted to the point that it is one of the biggest fan bases in Flash history. In a sea of basic stick figures setting a fairly low bar, this anti-hero won us over with both a distinct style and sense of humor, exciting action and stories, and a quality of game that never once wavered. This is everyone's favorite stick thief, Henry Stickman. How's it going everyone? My name is Graham and this is Flashlight, the series where I talk about the history of all things Flash related. With the highly anticipated release of the Henry Stickman Collection, which is out now by the way, this felt like the perfect opportunity to pay tribute to one of the biggest names in Flash games. If anyone hasn't heard, Puffballs United has been working on remaking the original Stickman series, as well as a brand new sixth installment advertised as being three times larger than any other installment before it. That new game, completing the mission, would be reason enough to buy this collection, but having an updated version of all the previous games is going to be so fun to revisit. They're the same stories and fails you know and love, but with completely redone art, tweaked animation, and some improved audio and effects. I know there's a stigma behind paying for something that is otherwise free, but I think when you see the amount of work poured into this project to redo everything, you'll see that it's well worth it. Puffballs was kind enough to answer a relatively lengthy interview from myself. Huge thank you to him for answering all my questions, I had so many of them. Especially so close to releasing this massive collection, I felt terrible taking away that much of his time. I'll be sprinkling snippets of that throughout so we can get his unique perspective on creating this series. The full unedited transcript of that interview is available on our Patreon page. Please consider supporting that, there's links in the description. It could be said that the series started back in 2007 with Crossing the Pit. Or if we want to go really deep, even slightly sooner than that with The Bridge. But those are more of just silly experiments rather than a formal Stickman game. The True Start came a year later with 2008's Breaking the Bank, released when Puffballs was still 17 years old. It's a really common story in the Flash world that people start out in their teens, probably playing around with some version of Flash on their school computers. The game made a small splash, earning a front page on Newgrounds and the Daily Fifth Prize, at a somewhat respectable 3.95. It's funny looking at Puffball's submission page here, referring to Henry as the guy. In these humble beginnings, it hadn't grown into a series and was still just a fun, fresh new idea. Up until fairly recently, Crossing the Pit and Breaking the Bank were actually listed in Puffball's movie page on his Newgrounds profile. I'm happy to see that everything has rightfully been migrated to the games section. The idea of selecting random options for funny results wasn't an entirely new idea prior to either of these games. It's like a less complex version of Whack Your Boss or other games like it. Funnily enough, I never really see this format for games, Flash or otherwise. It may not have been a particularly new idea for that original series, yet it has far outlived anyone else who was doing it. Back when I first learned how to make a button in Flash, I even made my own game in this vein. Killbo and Killbo 2. It seems that we share a similar game making origin of simply wanting to learn how to make buttons in Flash. I don't know, looking at the release order, perhaps I should be claiming a percentage of Puffball's earnings. It's pretty clear who influenced who here. Really though, Puffball's games are way more polished and clearly took the concept far beyond clicking some buttons. Although I can appreciate the hesitation he might have had calling these early installments games, I struggled with the same thing. But they're games. We, we can be firm about that now. Not to talk too much about myself, but I remember when I made Killbo 2, I was offered a $100 sponsorship. I was over the moon. Asking Puffballs what the first game of his was to make money, Breaking the Bank was picked up by Stickpage. But I don't remember how much it was for. A very similar price to your game, I think. It's wild to think of what peanuts that seems like. But these were small games with a limited audience and no knowledge of how big they would eventually become. Stick Page was a pretty big deal. Humble beginnings considering that Puffballs has been able to develop games full time now since 2014. 
For the full collection, Breaking the Bank actually had to be remade from scratch. Too much of it was on the rougher side and not really worth salvaging, and it's relatively short, so it made sense to just have a complete overhaul. I thought maybe that would be a cool opportunity to maybe include some references to those early non-installments. The bridge was a bunch of random unexpected happenings with no interactivity, and crossing the pit is just a simple series of buttons with no real characters or story or purpose. I wanted to try to stick close to the original game still. I also wanted to focus any new content into completing the mission. So, Crossing the Pit doesn't count, it's more of an experiment than anything. It will not be seen as an episode within the Henry Stickman collection. But without giving too much away, if you have at least some familiarity with it, then there may be a little something in there for you to keep an eye out for. A little over a year after Breaking the Bank is when we saw the third release, Escaping the Prison. But I should clarify this now and carry that forward about how the series is actually numbered. In the full collection, Breaking the Bank will be considered a prologue, which makes a lot of sense. It's fairly short and you technically can't win. There are no separate endings. And Crossing the Pit is just not a part of the series at all. And with all that in mind, Escaping the Prison is viewed as the first game in the series. At this point, things were evolving from a funny concept of choosing random options to see the wacky results, to suddenly becoming full-fledged stories and pioneering a genre all of its own. To this day, I still think there's nothing else really like it. If others have tried, they've pretty well all failed. I guess with all the Flash developers out there clicking their own series of success and failures, Puffballs is the only one who really found his way to a good ending. The game is no longer just clicking buttons, there's the inclusion of a bunch of creative branches and fails and successes, and the ability to earn a variety of actual endings. Escaping the Prison is really what propelled the series to that top tier level and suddenly had everyone clamoring for more Stickman. It earned the daily first place and weekly first and weekly review crew pick. The Stickman series really was still a hidden gem and risked being overlooked entirely. Maybe it still would have been something that is discovered months or years later, building up a fan base over a much longer time period. Luckily, it had its moment early on, and the rest is history. How individual things catch on in the Flash world is quite interesting. By nature, there's anywhere from a dozen to a hundred Flash games released daily. It's so easy for something to be overlooked. This is starting to become more true for Steam and Itch and Game Jolt releases. But it's a phenomenon that Flash creators have been well aware of for nearly two decades now. Nowadays, if something doesn't have that breakout moment in the first few days, or maybe a week, it's so easy to be lost to obscurity. Luckily, with all these games being free, there were thousands of people essentially running quality checks and helping to lift up the best of the best. What's a stickman to do after breaking himself out of prison? Why? Go immediately back to his life of crime, of course. Our third Stickman release, and now canonically the second proper game, we have Stealing the Diamond. It was a slow burn of a release, which I always love seeing. It took a few days to truly catch the public attention and receive the recognition it deserves. A front page feature two days after release would have helped a great deal with that. It wasn't picked up and carried into the mainstream immediately, but with the ever-growing populace of content creators and YouTubers out there, the series now is making its way into the Let's Play world. It took several years later, but this was Markiplier's own introduction to the series, after which time he went back to escaping the prison and played the other games. Considering how many Flash games there are, there's only a select few series that get this kind of prominent attention. It's not often that streamers and content creators lift up and propel Flash games, with those few notable exceptions. You're often trying to chase the new, hot, exciting thing, and older games and Flash submissions can sometimes fall by the wayside. But the Stickman series is a very notable example where that YouTube fanbase helped stimulate an entirely new audience, love, and culture surrounding the series. Look at those videos. They're averaging about 20 million views each, and that's just coming from one creator. Not to undermine the series' own success, Escaping the Prison had a million views on Newgrounds and 20 million worldwide well before the release of Stealing the Diamond and before it had a spotlight shone on it like a thief in the night. So I want to acknowledge that YouTube success, as it has become an important part of the Stickman legacy, but that's just one small rung in its own step ladder to mainstream popularity. With 200 hours of work, that's 8 full days, Stealing the Diamond was by far the largest game, doubling the previous fail count. 
Puff had to work on it in evenings, weekends, and over the summer holidays, with production spanning nine months. Even this relatively smaller game in the series was no small task. It released in 2011 with a daily second, weekly first, and review crew pick. There seems to be a common trend of these games not quite finding their audience on day one, but luckily always being discovered and appreciated shortly after. There was some pretty limited activity from Puffballs around 2012 while he mainly worked towards finishing college. He picked up a part-time job and began working on infiltrating the airship, which would release in 2013. After once again having a smash hit with that release, the possibility of transitioning to full-time game development was becoming a reality. Pairing up with a college friend, Fort Bass, for some smaller game projects, he can't do art and I can't do programming. Seemed like a good combo, though we didn't really even consider it until after college. Their studio, Inner Sloth, wouldn't be formed until later in 2015. Airship took twice as long to complete as Diamond, which is definitely reflected in the jam-packed content and overall improvements in the art and animation. While I'm talking about these improvements, it's been pretty wild to see these games steadily increase in the quality of art and detail, only to have that be completely blown away by the remasters. I had to ask what led to the Stickman style of so much of the backgrounds being primarily grayscale. I thought maybe it was to give more of a pen and paper feel, or reflect some early style from Puff Ball's comics he worked on? Some choice along those lines? Choice? <laughs> I was just bad at colors. Infiltrating the Airship is also the first game in the series to feature the villainous Top Hat clan, which have become a recurring force and will be the primary antagonists of completing the mission. One of Puffball's earliest animations, Operation Infiltration, it would have come between these two projects. I had to laugh at seeing the Top Hat clan existing so far back before ever debuting and in infiltrating the airship. It was created for an entirely different world. I love seeing artists reference themselves and borrowing ideas like that. It's also the first game to arguably have other main characters beyond everything simply being done by Henry. I think that expanding the world is really awesome and was a necessary next step for allowing the series to persist. Now we have others to bounce jokes off of, a cool buddy cop dynamic, real relationships to invest in, and so many other possibilities. I'm excited to see a lot of that come to fruition and pay off in that final game. The release of Airship on Newgrounds was a little odd. It only picked up a daily fourth. You'd think with the momentum of the series, it would have easily grabbed that daily first. And if you look at the relevant community post for that day, people were pretty baffled by this outcome. From the looks of it, there was some pretty classic Newgrounds-ness shenanigans going on that day that couldn't be helped. It doesn't happen often, but now and again, a day will either see several huge releases coincidentally land on the same day, burying what would have otherwise easily been the top, or we'll see specific groups review bomb to boost their own submissions. Neither are frequent, but they both happen, and this day had a bit of both. Toon Works Wonders was a part of a massive series spearheaded by Legendary Frog, one of the online animator OGs, and the Lock Legion, while making relatively decent content, could be somewhat notorious for review bombing other submissions to lift theirs up. But it's pretty clear now which of these better stood the test of time. Airship rightfully climbed the ranks after that and still earned the weekly first and review crew pick. The progression of robbing a bank, escaping a prison, and then pulling off a heist made a lot of sense. But as the series grew in its complexity of stories and characters, things start to deviate and become even more inventive with their settings. An airship and a massive criminal complex? Something I'd always wondered is what other possible storylines Puffballs had entertained at any point in the series. How close were we to seeing a dramatically different branch in the story? He was incredibly courteous and actually supplied me with an exclusive look at the first brainstorming page for Henry IV. We can see notes he wrote for himself about wanting the game to be more escape-oriented, but possibly not completely? Hmm, very committal. I really like seeing that internal struggle. Game dev is never simple. There was a desire to include references to all previous games, especially carrying things on from stealing the diamond. Maybe a plot involving trying to sell that off and things going awry. Aliens? Which seems to come up a few times in his brainstorming. This makes me think of where things eventually went in Riddle School. Once you're this many installments into a series, apparently that's a common way to start shaking things up. Maybe a government facility, criminals with top hats, 
and at one point having Henry try to deposit the stolen diamond in the bank he robbed. While that would have been very funny, it maybe would have been repetitive and just really not made sense. Reflecting on it now, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. It was originally going to take place in a government facility similar to the top portion of fleeing the complex, but it was jungle themed which we now appear to be seeing repurposed for completing the mission? I have to assume that setting and theme kind of lingered all these years later. You were captured and needed to escape. I planned out the first starting room and an intro, but it wasn't really going anywhere. And as we see in his own notes, there were growing concerns that maybe this plot was becoming too similar to escaping the prison. So I went back and started considering a different idea. You can see I picked the criminals with top hats idea. Their outpost location ended up being an airship, which I ripped from one of my old comics. Infiltrating the airship has the honor of having Puffball's personal favorite fail, the gravity bubble. It's a fail I came up with on my own, not a reference. And I'm really proud of the choke and punchline. Does pressing up increase the amount of gravity, or does it move you up in the air? Hmm. Although perhaps he'll have a new favorite in completing the mission that he isn't ready to share just yet. It's gonna be so fun to go hunting for all those weird new options. If there was ever a doubt of how big this series had become, Fleeing the Complex is one of only a select few Flash games that actually had a full-on trailer. Not only that, but that trailer is sitting at 1.8 million views. After 565 hours of long, hard work, releasing in 2015, this game easily swept the Newgrounds daily and weekly awards. Fleeing the Complex has roughly the same number of fails and endings as Airship, but it is a wildly larger game. There is so much more care, detail, and attention poured into every aspect of it. I don't know how many individual times I can gush over the leaps and bounds through which this series improved from one installment to the next. If one thing can be said about Puffballs, he knows how to take his time and make sure things are as good as they could be. When sharing details of crafting different series settings, Puff had a bit to share on how he landed on fleeing the complex as well. In some ways, it could be said that the concept for this game was conceived even before infiltrating the airship. It was planned to take place in a European old-timey kingdom of some type, with a castle and everything. I planned out the first few rooms, but then it started to break apart. So I looked through my old ideas, and I remembered the government facility actually being really cool. So I combined that facility with an unused top at outpost idea, the cliffside, and kept the foreign elements. I really love that he never threw anything away. A good idea is a good idea. Simply because it didn't work in one setting, there's no reason to not revisit it and see if there's a new way to repurpose things. This makes me feel like I need to be way more diligent about my brainstorming. I've had a tendency to throw things out once I feel like they no longer apply. I think this is an important lesson that anyone could learn about any form of writing, game development, or other creative projects. It's definitely worth thinking about. This series has hilariously almost ended several times now. Back in 2014, while working on fleeing the complex, Puff indicated that it would indeed be the final installment. Flash had reached its breaking point working in file sizes that large, and there was no conceivable way to top that density of content. Which if anyone's wondering, the games are still drawn and animated in Flash. They just need to be exported and used in other programs now. And fleeing the complex was far from the first time the end was in sight. Stealing the diamond was anticipated to be the last one. Trilogy and all that. Complex was softly meant to be the end, and I figured if people kept asking, I could just say the betrayed ending is the canon ending, Henry is dead, can't make more games. If people pestered me too much about it. Luckily, that's not the case. Although with a series that has remained this open-ended for all these years, and results in many branching endings, I'll be curious to see how things are wrapped up in completing the mission, and I really enjoy the idea that we'll probably have the freedom to decide which of those endings we want to be canon just creates a lot of fun opportunities for the fans. I asked if there were any retcons being made in the full collection, since many things were being redone anyways, and Puffballs did indicate that the presumed dead ending of fleeing the complex needed to be adjusted. You see an airplane taking off, presumably Henry is on it. I changed it to have him still wandering the cold. I needed to keep him in that area to make it easier for the continuity in completing the mission. As the series continued to grow and more and more characters were added, really starting to inflate to truly astounding amounts, with multiple characters recurring throughout, I kind of thought that the voice modifying shtick would eventually run its course. I was surprised that with the growing popularity, Puff never reached out to others, especially when Newgrounds is filled with potential voice actors. But I think that commitment to the bit ends up being its own unique style and really adds to the overall charm. But I was curious if there was a tipping point where it hadn't quite become a thing yet. 
and opportunities probably would have presented themselves, Puff had ever sought out more voice actors. Nope, never really did. In the early days I was too introverted to try, and now it would just kind of break tradition to get more people involved. That makes complete sense, and for what it's worth, I'm now glad he never did, or else we wouldn't get the truly amazing attempts at British, Scottish, Irish, Australian accents throughout. Seriously, once you have like a hundred voice characters, a good way to distinguish them is accents, and the dedication to that is always there, usually with a little self-deprecating joke involved in some way, and I love that. And one of the biggest, most important questions that I possibly could have asked, what up with the off-center text button designs? I don't know. I like it. Center is boring. I didn't really expect a real answer to that, but I'll take it. I don't know what more I can add when speaking to the different installments of the series, other than gushing over the effort that was taken to ensure every aspect of each one was bigger and better than the last. Puffballs has this creative drive and personal one-upmanship there that all but guarantees completing the mission and all the remasters are going to blow the original series out of the water. We're now at a point where this conclusion is set to be more of a finale than any before it. This truly is the culmination of all things Henry. That full collection is out now, there's a link in the description below, and it's being set at the more than reasonable $15. I know players are going to be super eager to dive straight into completing the mission, but that won't be immediately unlocked, which is done by design. You have to get at least one ending in order to unlock the next game. I'm treating it as a fresh experience, so in order to get the actual story, you have to play in order. Keep in mind that that's only one ending per game that can realistically be achieved in as little as a few minutes per game. But I really respect that choice, it'll give people an excellent reason to replay the remasters first and appreciate all that extra effort that went into updating them. Breaking the Bank was reanimated from scratch, so I felt I was more able to improve the fails since they're very stiff. With the rest of them, I didn't really want to mess with their core. There were only a select few fails that were changed, mostly because the background was so different I couldn't do the original fail. And as if that wasn't a strong enough motivation to revisit the entire series, maybe you're still a little apprehensive comprehensive and would rather jump to the end? I'm not sure if you know, but in completing the mission, you start by picking an ending from infiltrating the airship and fleeing the complex, and it gives you a unique path based on all the variables that would affect the story. I didn't know that, and it's so amazing. What an incredible way to acknowledge the continuity of the past games while maintaining a level of player autonomy to play however they wish. That level of choice and control is something that's never been present in these games before. It's so exciting to see those extra steps being taken to make this feel as fresh and unique and distinct as possible. And honestly, my brain starts to melt trying to think of the complexity of acknowledging all that past continuity for many different endings of two different games. I'm pretty sure the Telltale games never even had that attention to detail. And that's what their entire gimmick is. Puffballs has tracked the hours put into each installment over the years. Puff has actually joked that he's put more time into completing the mission than Team Fortress 2, and considering that basically every game has at least one if not several TF2 references, I'm gonna guess he has a lot of hours in that game. Seeing how that is ramped up here is incredible. That doesn't even include all the time poured into the remasters. Calculating those hours, completing the mission would have taken a full year of 40 hour work weeks with no holidays or breaks. Not to mention all the work in the remasters, bonus content like these silly character bios, and the fact that Inner Sloth released and has continued to support the very successful Among Us in that time. With all that in mind, it's pretty miraculous that this project is releasing as soon as it is. Puffballs might feel a little guilty that it was delayed a few times, but when you lay out the work like that, it's staggering. It's been a long, crazy journey, with the series being intended to come to a close on several occasions, and the love and dedication of the fans then topping up that creative tank and allowing the series to persist, and really earning its place as one of the most beloved Flash series of all time. I know there's a stigma about paying for Flash games. I mentioned it before earlier. I know people are hesitant to pay for content that's usually free, but I hope this really helps people understand where that price tag is coming from and how, if anything, $15 is under-evaluating the worth of this collection. When asking how Puff has avoided burnout after all these years, avoiding growing tired of his own series and keeping that creative pool filled, trying to balance his personal interest with audience demand, he added, it's been hard. Before completing the mission, I only took on games when they were all planned out on paper first, so I knew that I had enough content. Completing the mission was too big to keep straight in my head, and I didn't have enough content planned out on paper. I had a lot of trouble making sure that each path is consistent. 
So please go show Puffballs, the Inner Sloth team, and Henry Stickman some love. Whether that be replaying the old Flash games, watching some of your favorite content creators do Let's Plays, or purchasing this collection to play for yourself. Really, anything we can do to help support this series. Thank you to patrons of the channel. I'm really excited to finally cover this game. I'm probably going to be dedicating the rest of August to doing Easter eggs and secrets in the full remastered series. People probably largely know my content from doing Easter eggs, secrets, and reference videos, maybe the occasional theory. I actually started doing a similar series for the Henry Stickman games, starting with Escaping the Prison. I had completed and uploaded that first one, but with the release date of the full collection being set, I felt it made much more sense to wait for that to be released, and instead create that video video series for the remade versions. So anyone who's curious, I'll be redoing that video, similar to Puffball's own remastering I suppose, and carrying on that easter eggs and references series from there, you can expect the first of those probably next week. With things having to be redone for the remaster, I think I really did up the references in the remasters, but mostly with things in the background. So be sure to keep your eyes peeled while playing through, I know I will. I had actually scripted out and recorded this entire video before the collection came out. Once it did come out, I committed really hard to doing my own Let's Play of it. Like, really hard? I 100%ed the whole thing. So I'll make sure one of the end cards at the end of this video and a link in the description go to a playlist with that full playthrough. But absolutely, it's worth experiencing for yourself. If you're a fan of the series at all, please consider buying a copy for yourself. I'm looking forward to doing a lot more Henry Stickman content here in the near future. So yeah, between the two channels, there's going to be a lot of Stickmen in the near future. I hope you're all as excited for that as I am. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again.